Hey, welcome. Robert here. I'm here with Chris. Hello. How you doing? Good. And today we're going to talk about creating comics in 2022 and about how it's evolved, especially, in, I would say, in the past five years, six oh, years. Yeah, absolutely. It's really changed. And, and tr honestly, probably the past two years since yeah. the distribution, everything with COVID and all that, it's really right. changed. So, yeah, today we're going to discuss creating comics in 2022 and where are these comics going? You know, uh, you know, we had talked earlier and you were talking about you were in some boards and stuff and how everybody's making comics. Right. But we're not seeing them in the shops. So, where right. Are they yeah, going? it's like um, I was saying that you kind of wonder, it just seems like everyone's making comics. But then when you look at where you are on social media, in my case, Facebook on these groups, uh, a little bit on Instagram, I'm following groups of people who make comics. So it seems like everybody's making comic books. Right. But are they? <laughs> right. Are, are yeah. they completing them? But right. before we get into that, I shoot it to our sponsor. All right, so if they're making comics, where are they going with them? Because right. back in the day, we made comics. You know, we we this is what we were trying to achieve. We we're trying to make a print comic, um, and get it into the stores. You know, right. that was the ultimate thing. It was, was so hard. And oh yeah, it was. Um, from the fact that you know we've discussed back back in our day. <laughs> it, it, everybody wanted colored comics they wanted right. what marvel and dc was making they right. were wanting you know i i know early on in sky comics we actually watercolored and used dr martin dies just like valiant comic was doing in the early days you know yep. and the first issues of uh blood and roses were all hand watercolored i still got a bunch of the original watercolorings from those right and, and it's like that's what we we're trying to do to get it in the diamond but man you know, to print those, which was traditional printing, offset printing. Right. For those who don't know what offset printing is, it means it goes on the big press, gets right. printed in the sheets, and folded. It's, and, and the run is huge. It can, you can yeah. just print one. Yes. No. Yeah. Your yeah. minimum runs were usually, I would say, 5,000, three to mm -hmm. 5,000. And that price break on those pieces were very high at right. that point. So you truly weren't making money unless you... You, you always said, oh, but I'll take them to shows and sell them at cover price to offset the difference. Yeah. Which, which is a whole nother story. <laughs> yeah. How much, right. how much do, do you really sell at shows, you know? Um, I know for years and years and years, we kept packing thousands and thousands of books around with us wherever we moved to a warehouse or an office. And I think I lost a bunch of them in, in water damage or something. Ooh. And it was like, that sucks, but yeah. I don't have to move them anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Bittersweet. And, and that was about when print on demand was really getting hot and heavy and doing well in the digital. Mm -hmm. So it was more like, oh, damn, you know? Right. Well, but, okay. I never, I, I tried self publishing myself up, oh, geez, back in 92, I thought. And the first thing I did was a book called Bard, B A A R D. And it was black and white, and I could only afford one color for the cover. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until after I've done these two issues that I realized I could have used like tones and zipatones to create different right. levels of color mm -hmm. <laughs> of blue mm -hmm. or red or whatever I used. Eh, live and learn, right? Um, right. But after that, I, I took a loan out to pay for those. And um, I never paid them, I never paid, I paid the loan back. But it wasn't because of the books I sold. 
Right. And then at that point, I was like, you know what? I'm going to spend my time t- trying to get work, jobs. Right. And it wasn't until, you know, the internet and not necessarily social media, but the internet was where I really started thinking maybe it's time I just do my own thing. Mm-hmm. So I have mm-hmm. some experience from the old days, like you were saying, but um, a lot of what I, I, I did, did some of my own. And then also I spent a lot of time hanging out with people like yourself, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's funny as you talked about the last five years, especially the last three years, how this has really changed. I'm think I was, that made me think that the concept of a digital and online comic strip where you post art or a page two or three times a week, mm-hmm. that was seemed to have been around from the mid nineties up in late nineties, uh, maybe late nineties, maybe you know, yeah. So we're talking Plus. 10, 15 years. And well, that was the only digital online type option that there was. Right. Right. I mean, your earlier ones was like Penny Arcade who did mm-hmm. the strips and um, I'm trying to think of who else. There's, okay. there's a few of them out there that I followed. Girl you know, Genius, that, you said? Girl Genius. Now, you know, Phil came out, wanted to do comics. He put out a black and white comic. It didn't do well. He repackaged it to an online page. Like, I think it's three times a week. And it's been very successful. Many graphic novels, you know, and mm-hmm. later he's, he's hundreds and hundreds of pages. And yeah, it's done great for him. But it's like he never gave up on the idea. He knew the characters. He knew the story he wanted to do. Right. He just that first direction didn't work. I actually have the black and white comic, the first <laughs> yeah. one put out. And yeah. then I have like the first six or seven hardcover Girl Genius graphic novels. That he collected so, from his online from all right. his online stuff yeah it, it's amazing you said that because i got thinking it was over 10 years ago i was doing the clay'sway strip that's 10 know? years ago it was over 10 years ago i yeah. did three strips for i think i did three strips for that didn't i i know yeah you did three strips and steve stegman did a strip wow. and yeah i was like ten years. wow it's been 10 years so maybe that i guess what my point was is like like you had said it within the last five years you've got so many different ways like online uh not online um on demand printing that didn't that's not like it's that wasn't really, around 20 years ago not 20 years ago no it, it basically have flies probably over the, over the past 10 to 15 years right it's, the printers we had that you could set up in an office and do online printing just was not capable of truly holding the collar mm-hmm. and giving you a satisfactory you know of a product and then the the ability of trimming them down it was just it, it just didn't work right and truly probably yeah past 10 years it, it has really developed right so you know? i mean everything so, has literally changed you got that you've got webtoons you've got tons of other options within the last five years yes you know? yes and then just i think one thing that people should be looking at it's just selling your digital comics. I know now that comicology is merged over to Amazon, mm-hmm. which I sort of understand that there's, there's this massive amount of people that go to Amazon every second. Right. It's so big, you know, um, that Amazon feel like you're going to get more views over there mm-hmm. and, and possibly sell more products. And they might, but they spent the past year merging the two together. Right. And, you know, something that we discussed earlier is that you sort of have to resubmit your book. So if you had a book at Comicology and you didn't carry it over and resubmit it over over at Amazon, that would be their Kindle KDP, mm-hmm. um, Kindle Distribution Publishing, You, your book may or may not be on Amazon. So if you're a publisher, you didn't follow through, you need to follow through with that. Right. But definitely digital is is one way to get things out. There's still a handful of different digital distributors out there. I think each of them has sort of found their little niches. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, like you said, I, I hear people are drawing, people are doing things, but where are they going? And then two years ago, we had the bust up of Diamond, basically. Oh, yeah. You know, with COVID. Yep. And then DC decided they weren't waiting for Diamond. So they went off and sort of 
went to a mail order business. Right. Says, hey, yeah. you guys are going to distribute our books, Lunar. And then uh, Marvel said, well, we're out of here since our contract's void. And they went over to Penguin, Penguin Books. Right. Wasn't there so, a time where Marvel's, I thought they were trying to do it themselves, and then they just, and that didn't go well? I, I they bought Heroes World, Heroes World back in the 90s. I think. Okay, that might be when I'm, wow. <laughs> and Heroes World was, was, was a distributor like Diamond. They distributed right. a little bit of everybody. And what I remember that was that Marvel bought it and then, of course, pushed the international sales. Mm -hmm. And we got the largest order for Blue Line Art Supplies we'd ever gotten out of one distributor for one whole month. Really? And it carried on for about six months. And we're like, what are they doing with all this paper? And we were shipping and shipping and shipping paper. And then it just all disappeared. <laughs> So it's like, what happened here? You know? Yeah. And then next thing we know, Marvel's holding it down and they got back in bed with Diamond and just yeah. everything worked out. I, I remember hearing that what they had return problems and they had damage and they had am I right with that or am I blending yeah, a bunch they of weren't, stories? They weren't, they weren't prepared to run a distributor. Right. Okay. So but Let's come back to recent history because I actually thought that was recent history. That's how bad it is. Uh, it's been it for a while. Yeah, <laughs> it's the nineties. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, um, so yeah, that it broke it up and um, um, diamond COVID. is yeah. COVID. No, what happened with freaks and gods, which I thought was really weird, was um, the first issue of uh, freaks and gods from two one five. That was before they changed their name to uh, uh, Invader Comics. That one had um, from Diamond a, a, it was a small order, you know, mm -hmm. um, because going back to like we were saying back in the in the eighties and the nineties, if you did put your book in there, you were almost guaranteed at least a certain four digit number, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and it was almost like every time. Well, you had to to get right. your orders because right. Diamond Diamond was set up that. If you didn't serve a certain amount, and I think they were like that all the way up to recent, they just wouldn't place your orders. Right, but even before, like when I was like in the late '80s and the in the early '90s, there wasn't that. Mm -hmm. Back no. when there was Diamond and um, Capital, which was mm -hmm. from my home state. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so the first book had low numbers, and I was kind of disappointed. Um, but um, the publisher was excited because it was better than some of the other ones they've been doing. Right. So I'm like, okay, whatever. But that was back when Diamond had everybody. Right. Now then, let's jump ahead to just this year with uh, Freaks and Gods Volume 2, number one, published by Invader Comics. Again, they just changed their name. That's why there's a Volume 2. Number one orders were like probably about two and a half times that of number one from the first book. And I, for some reason, chalk it up to the fact that when people were going through previews and looking through the catalog, they had less, I had, I had less interference from Marvel and DC. Yes. More people may have seen Freaks and Gods and thought, hey, that looks kind of cool. Plus you had history. There's the history as well. It, yes. It, it, and it I was online around. a lot more. Right. So mm -hmm. I mean, maybe that all worked in. So I mean, right. know, there's a plus and minus to that. I mean. There is. I just wonder how long Diamond can stick around not having the big two. That's that's going to be the play. You know, right. will Image, Dark Horse, Boom, will these guys be able to carry them? Um, definitely, I would have to say they, they've had a downsize major. Oh, absolutely. I they, but, you can't, yeah. yeah, keep that staff that size. Right. Yeah. But, um, the, I, okay, so we have, like, now there's back to three distributors or at least two that you can distribute to. Yeah. Um, but is that what they're doing out there today? You had talked about how maybe even black and white comics are making a comeback. You know, yeah. we had the Elf Quest and the Cerebus comics back in the 80s. And oh, those 90s. were so awesome. Yeah, <laughs> oh my God, those were awesome. Some of them were comic size, some of them were magazine yeah. size. Yeah. Cool. Um, but now, you know, and then manga came out, it's been over 20 years into the US. Right. Um, which was cool. But it's it very just cool. seems like it's very it's just held on forever. Right. Well, there's I, I have my own personal reasons why that is, but I won't get into that. Okay. But I do but one thing you gotta always remember 
when you look at the manga, the books are thicker. So sure, you're like, okay, you're paying four or five bucks for a 22, 32 page book. It's all flashy color. But the manga is like 10 bucks, but it's like thick, like 200 plus pages, which is all black and white. What I was saying was back in the day, if you went into a comic book store, I even fell for this when I was a teenager. If I saw a black and white book, I was like, oh, that's, I don't want to, I don't want to read that. That looks terrible. Well, now, obviously <laughs> it's all different now. Once I started right. really getting into the art and everything and, and creating my own and, and, and you know, but I, I, I wonder if you can nowadays get by with a strictly black and white book, first of all, saving you on printing costs, if you're going to be printing it, even printing at an on demand, it's way cheaper than a color, a full color book. It is. Yes. Um, so, because people, the younger generations are going in, they're reading their manga, and they're used to seeing books in black and white, in with gray tones and whatnot. I wonder if hopefully that might have opened up, you know, because you could you could do your whole comic book, uh, color it like you normally would, and then just mm -hmm. desaturate every single page. And now you're printing this really great looking book in black and white, saving yourself a lot of money. And the readers might might be there for it. You know, um, the one book that comes to mind in modern day is Walking Dead. See, I was, I, I, you had said something earlier and I thought of Walking Dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they definitely, they play the tones, not so much what we used to call zip, zip a tone. Right. Because that's why you actually applied it to the original artwork. Of course, now today you would do it digitally. But they did play a lot with the tones and the shades of stuff with The Walking Dead. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that sort of helped keep or helped took the, the manga black and white and sort of, you know, made it in a mainstream comics. Because, you know, right. definitely Walking Dead's mainstream comics. Um, oh, yeah. Even though they ended it, now they're republishing it in color. Uh, uh, imagine yeah. that. You know, yeah, but yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just wondering. Cause a reason I came with that, because as you were talking, I'm thinking, yeah, but does the artwork have to look mon? You know, there's a style and right. look to manga, right. and I'm just wondering. I wonder if the artwork needs to look like manga. If that's, if that's what they're looking for. But then I'm in in my mind, I'm thinking, well, if there's Walking Dead. There's Walking Dead, right? You know. Right. Yeah. And I also think Walking Dead, um, I think two re two reasons for the particular tone that they went with was A, it was a zombie book. <laughs> and bright, flashy colors would not do very well in my mind for a zombie book. So black and white with the tones and the, the moodiness, awesome. Oh, by the way, it's cheaper to print. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's it's a, print, added which, bonus. which made more profit for the creator. Yeah, you know? everybody involved. Definitely. Right. Mm -hmm. But now does the manga have to look, does your comic have to look like, well, what I would say to that, anytime anyone's ever talked about style and what your book's going to look like is if you're hiring someone, this probably doesn't apply to you. But if you're the artist, mm -hmm. should my book look like manga? My answer to that is, do you draw that way? Right. Because if you do, then that's how it's going to look. If you draw more of a, like a traditional illustrator look, something like from the 30s, 40s, 50s, that's how you draw. You know, if you right. draw kind of like cartoony, that's how your book should look. <laughs> right. Sometimes right. I, I, I mean, I'm, I don't want to say I'm passionate about it, but I just see a lot of these younger artists commenting about how do I get that style? Well, that style isn't something you get. It's something no. you develop. Exactly. It's you. Like yeah. when I draw, when, when I draw, it's always cartoony. Every, mm -hmm. all of my characters are kind of short, round headed. They roll, they roll up their jeans a little bit because they're too short. You know, this, that look. Well, mm -hmm. <laughs> if I look in the mirror, <laughs> I'm round headed, short, and I used to roll up my jeans. You know what I mean? It's like your art is actually like a reflection of. It can be. Uh -huh. Of the people around you and you that you see all the time. So, right. Um, yeah, so that's the answer, my answer to the well, whole style thing. I don't know how we got onto it, but you know, you mentioned the manga and, and the look, right? The uh, look. Uh, well, real quick, another thing we might have to come back and discuss style is that uh, I've been taught, you know, over the years, out of 30 plus years, I've been with Sketch Magazine, I've talked to you know hundreds of artists, and one thing that 
definitely came up with some guys from image early on was that a style is the mistakes that we make when we draw oh whether it foreshortens or we put details or we don't put details these are the mistakes that then becomes our style our look way we oh. do it so you know for them you know we're always trying to get that realistic look but is it there you know we're mm-hmm. always trying to get no you know um i definitely do more cartoony work we were looking at some of the right. gaming artwork that i'm working on and it, it's the mistakes that we make by leaving stuff out or foreshortening or using lighting or not using lighting um yeah, it sort of right. around to that. Yeah, so that I, 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 so, I, I never thought of it that way. Um, it's just like um, you create shortcuts, mistakes, and it just becomes how you do it. But mm-hmm. then again, I mean, you, you think of John Byrne, you look at his art and you look at the man and you're like, wow, it, it, his shortcuts. art looks like him. It does, but there's a lot of shortcuts. But do you, but do you see what I'm have saying? You, Barry Windsor Smith, him? same same thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's weird how that works. I don't, you know. Have you ever seen John Byrne do some artwork where he, I know that he, he should never do circles and then he goes straight to inks? Yeah. Yeah. He should Woo. never ink himself. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. I, I have Harry, noticed it. Harry Austin was the best inker for John Byrne. Oh my oh, oh that could be like three videos right there. I absolutely love that team. Yeah. Terry Austin's one of my favorite inkers. Um yeah. God. yeah. That's, that's, okay, that's enough video, of that. But, We're not talking about right. that right now, Bob. No. Creating comics in 2022. I guess where what we sort of start talking about distributors because that's mm-hmm. sort of what we were trying to achieve back in the day. Or right. it, just when we're making comics, it was we wanted to be in stores. The funny thing that happened to me is about 14 years ago, 13 years ago, I sold uh my last store, Comics to Games, here in Northern Kentucky. I sold it to a man and wife, mm-hmm. and they ran it since. They invited me back for like free comic book day a few times. Mm-hmm. And in one of those conversations, I was like, what would it take for me to be on, you know, on the shelf here? You know, how can I get my books that I was working on at the time? I think it was Clay's Way uh, and a couple other projects um, on the shelf. And and she basically broke it down and, and she was very honest about how much money they have to make her spot in that store to oh. take care of their overhead. There's, it's, there's nothing free to them. They right. pay by the square footage and then you have all your overheads, which now that I own the largest retro video game stores in Northern Kentucky, you understand? I totally really, yeah. yeah. You know, we got almost 5,000 square feet and we got a lot of overhead, a lot, everything needs to make money somehow, some way. But at that point I was like, Oh, so the best thing I could do was bring an audience to her to justify to have that spot. Right. So that's when I went off and started doing the Clayway comic strip, uh, more digital stuff, releases, trying to build my own audience up so that I had something. Then I could go back to store and say, hey, you know, we have this audience, I believe. It would expand even more if you give us a shot, you know. Right. So, um, you, you got to think about that. Yeah. Um, it sounds like she ran that. Uh, it sounds like you you ran the store like kind of more like a wild west. Like, oh, I'll put some books in there, and people will come in and buy them and make the a list. The problem with being a creator and a publisher yeah. is that you wanted to support every indie guy out there. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know. I know. Now, the good thing is. Is these guys are great too. Don't get me right. wrong; they support a lot of indie guys. And, yeah, but it and sounds like they've too. really got it. Like, like, but like, she understands how yeah. it works and what. And thirteen years later, they're where I'm right now in my office at the new YouTube studios. They're literally four doors down. Right, yeah, I rented out a spot in the same plaza. They're still there. They sell ton of comics. They sell graphic novels. They sell toys. Um, they even took a storefront closer. And they got a full arc and an RK, a pinball room. He's oh, a big pinball player. Nice. And he's got like 12 or 13 pinball machines in there. So yeah, they're doing well with the store. They've taken so, it in directions I never would have. So it sounds like the it sounds like a second tier version of a uh, um 
uh, gosh, I can't think of the word I'm thinking of. Like when Diamond had a benchmark, you had to sell a certain amount. It sounds like this particular store, having run the numbers and, and just done all that kind of, mm-hmm. has found like they have a certain tier that they that they need to meet. So they're looking through the catalog and they want to bring in some independence. Mm-hmm. Number one, from people they've never heard of, from characters they never heard of, might be difficult to... Might be difficult. Or she's just very nicely was telling me that my book was shit and she wasn't going to put it on the shelf. Yeah. Yeah. So she gave you like this long, <laughs> yeah. she gave no, you this like no, no, long no. math yeah. economics yeah. lesson lesson when in just, reality she just wanted just to say, eh, I don't like the book, yeah. it sucks. I don't think it is at all. Sorry, Bob. No, no. <laughs> no, no, that's actually that's that. really funny. <laughs> but you know, it, it, it's so I don't think the dream today in 2022 is getting in the comic shops anymore. Because I personally worry about comic shops. Yeah, how they're going to survive. How they're going to make it the next 10 years, 15, 20 years. Um, it's definitely online, mm-hmm. you know. So, uh, print on demand. Um, there's the one guy out of Florida. Um, oh, um, that's uh, K- Kablam is the print on demand. Indie, Indie Planet is their um, oh, yeah. store side, which is really oh, a great place to go. Or print on demand, right? Right, yeah. 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 So, so yeah, you, you can also put your digital file there too. They they, they will sell your book right. print on demand or digital indie planet. Um right. Yeah. Barry um, Gregory. Yeah, yeah. That's his name. Barry. So yeah, you know, you've got a lot of options out there. Mm-hmm. And I think I think this move with Common College and Amazon is gonna offer some print on demand. So what I'm getting at, it used to be if you went digital, you really didn't have physical copies to take around the shows right. and conventions, but now there is those options out there. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's actually Amazon I, or Lamb. Or, yeah. I don't want to say that there's, there's more, other ones. more printed comics nowadays, but back in back then it was either you're online or you were printed in a store. Now that's not the case. I mean, no, no, no. Many so there's a options. lot more options. And with um, Amazon, I have not uploaded any of my comic books to Comicology. My publisher did. So I don't know if they've, transferred those over since the the complete merger but i do have tales of the dark tunnel which i did a kickstarter a couple of years ago for i have that on amazon through kdp and the upload process easy yeah it's it's not simple a i mean and then you and, can you can make still, it what's great is you can make it available in print yes on their kindle or you know the digital and then they have a thing where you can do page reads right where you can offer your book to people who have paid for uh, like a monthly service through Amazon, uh, like Kindle Unlimited, I think it's called. And yeah, so. every time they, every time a page is read, you get like it's like a little tiny bit of a global fund. It's a kind of a weird system they got going there. But uh, mm-hmm. right now, I got some stuff up there, and I'm at 2,700 page reads this awesome. month, which is crazy because normally my months are like that at the end. So right. yeah, I mean, it's make a, I mean, you know, yeah. sure, it's only 63 cents, but you know what? That's 63 cents. I did right. have yesterday. That's right. <laughs> it all goes That's together. Right. It does. It all adds up. Yeah. So yeah, definitely there's there's many many, many options, more than what we ever thought about. Um yeah. and then just publishing online. You know, like we said, the girl genius direction where you have your own website and you're publishing to eventually make collections mm-hmm. um in digital and in print. Or there's some um community sites out there um that I know a lot of those are heavily based with manga books, but All right. um, I'm trying to think of, um, I don't have any emails, but um, there's one out there. To, is it something Tune? Well, there's Webtoon, but that's yeah, not what you're that, thinking of, is it? I don't know, honestly. It may or may not be. I know. I get an e- you can subscribe to them, which is I like because when there's a new post, they will send you a link saying, "Hey, there's a oh, new comic up that you the new read. the new strip is up this week or whatever, right?" Oh, this nice. this webtoons. It is okay, and I, I just will plug it. It is a uh, nothing special by Katie Cook. It's okay. the one that I'm subscribed to, and um, yeah, so. Those are good because they're more, they're not just strips. They, they like 
page formats. Right. Webtoon does. Right. Which the updated um, version of the last couple updates of um, Clip Studio Paint uh, actually has a Webtoon button to create preset sizes already. Really? Yeah. Um, that's pretty Ooh. awesome. That's Let's not forget um, places like Etsy or Gumroad. If you're going to do digital, uh, mm -hmm. if you go and you buy like say 50 books of print on demand, you bought you print a hundred of your comic, you can then put it on Etsy, and then you're literally kind of like your own, you know, distributor. I, I just taught you into Etsy. You did. But, uh, the cool, but what are they looking for when they go to your store? They're looking for a souvenir at that point. They want it signed. That's what I always came across, and that's good. That's well, a good thing. Yeah, if you well, want to ask me to sign my stuff yet. <laughs> okay. Do you have it as a check mark where they can check mark it? No, I didn't. Okay. That's a I'm thing. Look at I better I better look into that. You need to research that. Or you have to either it's a check mark where do you want it signed yes or no? Oh, or you God, have to add a second that. product. I can't remember. Okay. Like okay. one sign, one not signed. Um, I, I'm not using Etsy right now. I've got everything over at my own store that I host. Mm -hmm, right. Um, but yeah, I mean, at that point, they're buying souvenirs. They know your book, whether they read right. it online, they met you at a show, um, they bought your Kickstarter. We didn't even talk about crowdfunding yet. Oh, well, um, we did briefly, but yeah, yeah. In, in, in another video. <laughs> yeah, in other vid past videos. But yeah, when they're going to your personal store, they're, they're, I always feel like they're more looking like at a convention. They're right. looking at souvenirs. And then hopefully they get in and buy every copy that you ever made. Right. I've actually had a, a couple of people who have actually done that, who've dropped and bought every single book. Um, kind of surprised. Good. So I wrote them a nice little note and I gave them some extra stuff that I had from That's a previous Kickstarter cool. that I, I have stuff left over from a previous Kickstarter that I don't really think I'm going to bundle to sell. So I'm going to kind of use those as, you know, I sell everything on my store. Like I know you do. Cards, I know. The stickers, the, you know, so, know. you know, so I know okay. I'm terrible. I'm terrible. No, you're not. <laughs> another damn way. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Another way to uh, get your book out there. If you have a following is of course, Kickstarter or Indiegogo. Mm -hmm. Right. Those, those can build. Um, it's, it's like a party, right? You know, you can build up to a 15 day, 30 day, 60 day uh, program. Right. And, um, you know, to, to, to me, the two big successes right now is Brian Polito and uh, Billy Tucci yep. from She. Yep. Both of those. Um, Brian seems to be really just on Kickstarter, but I mean, the dude is raising a ridiculous amount of money. His oh, team yeah. is wonderful. They do a great job. Um, Billy's doing great on Indiegogo, and then he jumps over and does a Kickstarter. Right. And, you know, I always support him over in Indy, support Brian over on Kickstarter. But you sort of have to have some type of social media and or email list following. Right. Because you've got to reach out to people. you got to stay in front of them about it. You've got to remind them about it. And you got to make it fun. You're right. You so, can, you know, I when I did my first one by myself, I was on social media, primarily Facebook with the, with the groups for uh, public domain characters for probably six months to a year before I did my Kickstarter. Um, I, I would say you could start off. I think a Kickstarter, you don't, I don't know if you necessarily need a full on huge following, but if you're first, if it's your first Kickstarter, keep it small, keep it mm. simple. Because mm. if you do like a 500 goal and, you know, and you get, the 500, 600 bucks. Okay. You know what? And the next one you've got, you now have a following, right? A bigger following, right? You go right. from that way. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, but yeah, it, you have to, you have to start building it somewhere. Now it's whether you're taking, you know, if you're, you're publishing digitally and now you want to do a printed collection, you go to Indiegogo, mm -hmm. um, or Kickstarter. Um, there you got to supply a physical, you just about got to supply a physical, uh, well, you could do a digital. You could do guess. a digital only. Yes, I yeah. Why uh oh, new idea. Bulb above, above Bob's well, head. Well, <laughs> the the thing is, as you know, our our team here is moving into creating video games. Right. And video games, those guys definitely just do digital releases. Right. 
you know, they're not looking to do the whole physical because you're talking tens of thousands of dollars to invest right. into creating physical product for video games. Um, that's all. That's also if you're accepted, like through PlayStation or Nintendo, mm -hmm. to do it for their systems. So those guys really do release it on a PC digital release through Steam, usually. Right. And so yeah, I, I I can see, I can see doing a digital release for a comic, but I just I, I don't think you're going to get the following personally that you would do on a printed version. I know on yeah. the ones I ran. Digital has always been very few, printed, much higher. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. True. That's that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and and also stretch goals. I mean, you're gonna send them a digital bookmark, <laughs> a sticker. That's you know, I mean, more artwork. Uh, yeah, yeah, more artwork. You know, um, but yeah. Um, I guess you could add more content to the book. You could. That the book could just be like show. really huge. Yeah, you can say, "Hey, we're going to add another four pages to the book if we hit this." Yeah, every goal. every every yeah every stretch goal add add mm -hmm. more pages. Yeah, that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, yeah, so. that you know. Oh, and then the other thing that we we hardly ever talk about um, is Patreon. Basically, yeah, a monthly subscription service to you as an artist, um, or team. Or in video games, they, they right. build them around teams. Teams, right. Well, you could also do as you know a monthly subscription to your book. Yes. People are paying monthly. You don't necessarily have to deliver a full book every month, just however you want to set it up. But right. I'm telling you from experience and from what I've heard and from what you've told me, Bob, you have to go in with some level of an audience. Yes. Patreon is not a place to build an audience. It is not. No, you have you to have bring something. them to you over there. Right. And see, that's we've built our Skystorm Game Studio Patreon. Mm -hmm. Zero. And we built it four months ago. It's at zero because we have not promoted it. Mm -hmm. And we've sort of held off because we originally skinned it with the Paradox Wars game that we were going to do. And now right. we backtracked and we're full fledged going with the uh, Skystorm Chronicles game. Right. So we got to get artwork to reskin the Patreon. Reskin it means putting the, the artwork, the header artwork, um, and reskinning the whole website. So we're sort of on standby waiting to get some of that artwork done, which reminds me, I need to talk to you after this about some other artwork. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah. And that, so there's nobody out there searching in Patreon. Now, what was, what I did do, is I went to Mike, I can't remember, it starts with an M. He's on my Facebook. He does really cool Batgirl, Supergirl artwork, real simplicity style. I absolutely love it. And I think his series of graphic novels is Cleopatra. So, Mike, I gave you the biggest plug I could without remembering your last name. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, but I did follow his Patreon. I didn't know you could follow without actually donating money. Yeah, You don't really yeah. get to see anything. So... And the reason I did that was that once we go live and really go active with our Patreon page, that means I'll be over there on a daily basis. I'd rather search around and check out some other people's stuff too while mm -hmm. I'm over there. Right. It's five bucks a month. You know, it's, yeah. you can't even get a Big Mac for five bucks probably, or maybe, <laughs> maybe just five bucks. Um, so yeah, I mean, one less Big Mac. My heart doctor loves that. So that's yeah, great, yeah. you know? So Yeah. Um, but you can't follow them, which I had no clue. I'm interested yeah. to see if I get an email, you know, mm -hmm. via, because I had to have my account. So I was in my account when I was over there, when I follow it. So I'm interested if Mike makes a post, if I'm going to get an email, hey, Mike just made a post. I think you do, because I follow, a, there's a couple, there's this one part, I followed a couple of them, and I and I kind of un, unfollowed a few of them. Yeah. And uh, apparently, I still get an email every time this particular creator posts something, like uh -huh. like a, a reward. No, I'm not. I'm just following. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I mean, even there, um, people get aware of it that way, you know. Um, but you're right; people don't normally go. I don't think people go to Patreon and go monthly comic book, you know, search and for that. Search around. No, no. They, they, they don't. I mean, they go there and search for. You know, Bob Hickey, yeah. Chris Stryer, or whatever. They yeah. they look for a person right. if they search there at all. 
Right. Otherwise, they they might be. I would. I'm curious to know what the traffic is to Patreon. I wonder if it's um, like what's the um, percentage of external over internal driving to your to a page. Hmm. That's true. Yeah. Um, the whole reason we went after a setup because one video game studio is literally pulling down forty thousand dollars a month. Right. Ooh, and they yeah. they still have not produced their game in three years. What? So I'm like, what? Yeah, exactly. I was like, what? Sounds so like it's really deal. just another tool for us to use. It's where we will blog right. and do a lot of that kind of stuff behind the scenes. Um, if you want to be part of our, our beta team, it's going to be on the Patreon page. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's how we're going to use it. It's, it's sort of our personal behind the scenes stuff. Right. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's another thing that you can use to build yourself. I know there's people over there who just publish their strips over there. You know, hey, yeah. toss me a dollar a month and you get all my strips. Right. Uh, you know, so it, it is definitely a way to to do that and to benefit from it. And I still think you got to you got to use social media and email lists to draw them, whether you're posting sketches, mm -hmm. uh, loose layouts and saying, hey, you want to see the finished strip? Right. Check that out. So, yep, yeah. that's how you get that. That's how you do it. But it is another option. It is an option. And yeah. I think there might be other versions of that are like Patreon, but I don't I don't remember their names right, right now. I think it's I, I feel like Patreon is sort of the Kickstarter and Indiegogo of crowdfunding. Because I right. know there's several different ones out there other than those. Right. But those two have the largest crowd. Right. They're, they're known. I'd say Patreon definitely is is better known. So right. Um creating comics twenty twenty two. We have just broad reached out and discussed everything, not really breaking it down to exactly how to do it, but it all comes down to one thing. And that's just draw and write. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. Yep. Draw, you gotta and draw it, write, maybe, create it, write it. Create it, write it, draw. Mm -hmm. Then there, as we just discussed, there's many options for you to take it out and mm -hmm. build that audience. Just there's, you know, you can do it. I feel like you've got how to distribute it is what your time allows you to do. Can right. you do a strip a week? Can you do five strips a week? Can you do a finished page a week? Can you do three finished pages a week? What can you create? Mm -hmm. And and okay, first you got to create, write, and draw, but then you have to be consistent. Right. Yeah. So like if you're going to post on Tuesday afternoon at one o'clock, post Tuesday afternoon at one o'clock. Mm -hmm. Have it there. You know, you can post it anytime before then, but have it there Tuesday at one o'clock. Exactly. People will look for you. That's been one thing with the YouTube channel because you and I get ahead and then we both get busy and we might skip a week. Right. And yeah. I've gotten some emails like, where are you guys? Yeah. I'm like, what? Just, Where are you guys? Okay. I was expecting it. I'm like, we're, we're coming. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, we're also working and do other things too. So yeah, um, we're going to try to be out every week. Right. Um, it's just, I, I know it's more professional, um, but I know Chris is juggling a lot of things. We're juggling the new YouTube studio. We're yeah. juggling the new gaming studio. And as I mentioned earlier, I co-own one of the largest retro video game stores in Northern Kentucky. It's like, Oh, yeah. And there's also family and kids and grandkids. It's like, oh, you know, everything. So yeah. we have lives, but I understand the professionalism of being out. And you, you've you done pretty well with your videos on your channel. Uh, yeah, I least, uh, I found some spare time and I just, I had like, I I think I the last time I, I scheduled, I scheduled six weeks out. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And um, last night I scheduled one. And, my computer died, so I had to wait to get a new one. So now I'm on my new one. Right. But in that time, I had those six weeks scheduled. And a friend of mine was like, well, aren't you glad you worked ahead? Yeah. I was like, yeah, kind of. So right yeah. now, currently, I'm two weeks out. And I've just okay. exported three more videos I need to. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So and Yeah. So at the end of the day, all this is work, too. It takes time. It get does. As far ahead mm -hmm. as you can. If you're going to do a weekly strip, you might want to get two, three, or four weeks out. You might yeah. want to get it as far ahead as you can because you never know what's going to happen, what's going to come up personally, right. health-wise, 
uh, computers die. You just never yeah. know what's going mm -hmm. on. Right. And with working up with, with the strips, I know that there's, you know, and I, I've fallen for this. It's like, no, I got to get it out. No, I got to get it out. I'm, I'm going to miss an opportunity or I, I got to get it out. Well, you're not going to miss anything if you're still sharing panels and sketches of the pages or the, the you know, prior mm -hmm. to you, while you're building up a backlog of pages or strips, if you're going to go the online route. Mm -hmm. And that's building that audience. Yep, it's building the audience. Keeping them involved. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. So, all right, Comics 2022. We sort of discussed a whole bunch of stuff. Hopefully you can pick something from there and run with it. And, you know, if you got more questions, Chris and I have dabbled in many of these different things. Post them below, ask us questions. Uh, there will be an email up above. It's sketch at nostalgicnetwork.com. Um, also, please check out our Indiegogo for Sketch 47. Um, we're going to be making more announcements about what's going on with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll see you back here next week. Yep, next week. On time. Promise. Yeah. All right. All right. Take care, Chris. Bye.